Guys, my name is Steve Harper. I'm the CEO of Owner Insight and also the Chief Rippler at The Ripple Effect. And we are going to do a joint presentation, joint podcast today featuring an entrepreneur that I am super excited to meet. Her name is Maggie Kuiper. She's with Harpeth Painting in Nashville, Tennessee. I met Maggie through her dad, uh, Jeffrey Cornwall, who was a professor out at Belmont, ran the Entrepreneur uh, Center there until he retired recently. And we have stayed in contact because they featured my book, The Ripple Effect, uh, as part of their course curriculum, still do. And he and I were talking one day, just as entrepreneurs tend to do, and he mentioned his his daughter and just the, the pride that beamed from this man was, was infectious. And I just wanted to know more about her. The more I dug in, the more I learned, had a conversation with her. This woman had, and her husband have done an amazing job growing this company uh, from nothing to well over $9 million a year. And so there is so much to pull out of this from an entrepreneur's perspective. And of course, as one of our focuses with Owner Insight is to provide uh, exposure and try to get the word out about women that are doing amazing things in the, in the construction space. And obviously Maggie and her team are doing just that. So I'm so grateful that she agreed to be a part of this, what we're going to call a hybrid po podcast, because we're going to use it for both audiences, because there's no doubt there are some ripples that were created along the way with Maggie. And there's just some amazing uh, and inspirational stories I'm sure she will tell that might help guide someone that is out there, a young uh, female entrepreneur, maybe to start their own business or to want to explore this as an avenue in construction. There are just so many ways that we could take this conversation. I don't know where it's going to go, where it's going to end up, but I do know we're going to have a lot of fun. So I'm grateful that Maggie has agreed to join us. So let's dive right in. Maggie, thank you so much for making time today. I'm so grateful to have you. Welcome to this uh, very unique podcast. How's it going today? Good. I'm so excited to be here. I'm excited as well. I have been looking forward to this ever since your dad put us in touch. And I, the more that I went down the rabbit hole, um, first of all, I want to make sure that I said your name correctly in the intro, Maggie Kuiper, right? Nailed it. Nailed, Nailed it. Nailed it. All right. Because uh, I know there were a couple out there, a couple of podcast episodes. I was like, you know, I just want to make sure I get it correct. Um, there were a couple that, you know, kind of did the alternative na uh, name. So I wanted to make sure I got this one correct, but um, I went down the rabbit hole and I'm, I'm amazed at how much you are engaged and involved in just helping the painting industry in general, but really helping uh, everyone that has a desire to go down this path, to start their own business, to be a supporter of it, even though technically you're a competitor to them. So what, what drives that and what motivates you to do, do that and create that kind of network? Man, you did your research, right? <laughs> I try. I do my best. Um, that's that's a cool cool question. Um, so, I think you know I've always carried the mindset that um, I think if we all support each other, everyone's going to benefit. Yep. Um, I grew up playing pretty competitive volleyball, and. Um, it was only more fun to play against our rivals when they were as good as we were, right? Like, yep. yeah, yeah, <laughs> um, keeps you on your game, right? Yeah, it keeps you on your game. Um, but in the end, I really believe it cut it elevates the customer experience. And so, one of our big frustrations is when we're bidding against a client, whether it's in a big commercial job or you know, straight to my next door neighbor. And, you know, we put a lot of time and effort into making sure it's done right, training our crews, making sure the product's right, making sure we're covered with insurance. We put all this work into the details sure. um, only to lose to someone who just, you know, has bald tires on their truck and slaps a price on it so that he can not go out of business Friday. Yeah. And so, yeah. Um, so I think that's that's to us that's more frustrating than losing to someone that is our caliber and you know puts in the work that we put in. At that point, it's like, hey, good game, <laughs> you know. Yeah. yeah, 
Well, I, the thing I liked, and, and I listened to this on a couple of different podcasts, is that you 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 don't make it a secret as to how you go about building your business and what you guys have done to be successful. You're, and I think that kind of goes to that point of you know, kind of a rising tide helps all boats, right? Yeah, you know, you're yeah. you're trying to help them figure out how you've gone from zero to over nine million dollars in business and have one of the best reputations in Nashville. And you're not just like, hey, we're up here on top, and that's where we're sta- we're staying, and we're we're going to try and keep everybody at bay. But you're literally trying to pick up the industry because there is a standard. It's you know, the thing I really loved about your website. I, I want to make sure I don't butcher the um, the tagline, but connecting character and craftsmanship. And what I really felt with everything I I listened to in terms of the podcast or anything I read about you that whole character piece is a big factor. And I think that comes across in terms of how you're trying to help anyone who's in the industry, who's really committed to delivering that level of quality and craftsmanship. Yeah, that's beautiful. You should write our marketing ads. (laughs) (laughs) I I don't know. I think you do a pretty good job on your own. (laughs) What, you know, so raising the game so that when you do have competition and it brings the best out in the best environment, obviously offers the best solution to the client, right? At the end of the day, where, where does that come from relative to the, um, the approach that you guys take? Because it is a competitive space. I was thinking to myself, gosh, if I was starting a painting business, I would be like, it's got, you'd have to be scrappy and you got to be like really, uh, putting out tons of proposals in order to generate the kind of revenue that you guys are doing, but you guys are seeming to do it seem, you know, seamlessly. So how, how did that come about and how, how is that applied into your business strategy? You know, um, I'm hearing you talk and it reminds me of, of the, you know, going back to the volleyball analogy, but you know, what we're doing is we're putting liquid on walls. Yep. I mean, it's a pretty low barrier to entry, right? Yep. Granted, if you do check out like our Instagram and see like we're doing some pretty complicated versions of liquid on walls. You are very complicated. At the same time, there's also times that we're just putting liquid on walls. And um, I had a college coach who always used to say, you know, he would end everything he talked about. He was just like, you know, this is life and times, guys. Volleyball is like one little piece of all of this. And this liquid we're putting on walls is just one little piece of all of this. And so, you know, as we built this, and I think this is answering your question, but as we built this, the emphasis is on people for us. I the people that. we hire, um, the people we interact with, the people we work with, the people we work for, um, our vendors, our, you know, our insurance, our like everything is about the people for us. Um, because in the end, you could replace the word paint with anything, right? Sure. Um, our business is a service industry. Our business is a relationship industry. And we're just really trying to remember that there's more to the world than paint. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think that has really helped the culture of everyone who works for us have that mentality that you're talking about, which is, you know, this it's not about the dollar and it's not about, you know, us in the end. I love, I love that. I mean, the, the quality rings through in the work, but it also rings through in in terms of the customer experience, working with you from how they call and what they experience on your website, all the way to, you know, getting that proposal and making the determination to go with you. But, you know, that's, that's the hard part, but the real hard part in your space is the deliverable, which is the people that show up, the crew that, you know, interacts with the customer, how they, how they take care of the job site and in the level of attention to detail that they put there. And I, I think we probably have all experienced at one point or another, uh, an experience with a contractor that doesn't go well. And, you know, you're kind of left, you know, frustrated and upset, but you need the job done. So you just don't say anything. But when you find somebody that has a level of uh, attention like you guys seem to have, it's like, oh my gosh. And I could only imagine that just spurns like referrals, you know, eternal for you. Yeah. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's pretty humorous how kind of simple it is, you know, have a website, <laughs> respond to emails, respond to phone calls. And all of a sudden you're just like this high caliber company, <laughs> but, yeah. um, you know, and I, we lead, the, I'm, yes, we aim for the highest level of work. We aim for the highest level of quality. 
Um, we aim for the best customer experience. We will fall short. Um, it will happen because we're human. And I think Things that's happen. a yeah. component that, you know, it's not a, we, as parents, we talk a lot about patterns versus instances, right? Yep. And so yep. It's not a pattern that we fall short, but if there's an instance that we do, you know, we are, we own it, we apologize, you know, we take our ego and push it out the door. And I think that goes a long way too, is acknowledging that you're not bulletproof. <laughs> Because if I tried to be bulletproof, I think I would be in the fetal position yeah. in the psych ward. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. How did you go down this path as an entrepreneur? I, I want you to approach this from two perspectives. We have entrepreneurs that will follow this through the ripple effect and will be inspired by this story, but also for people that, uh, especially women that are thinking about, you know, I... I feel like I, I could move in this direction with the construction space, but it's, it generally has been a male dominated space. So I'm really curious as to how you uh, got up the gumption to go down this path and, and what do you think some of the secrets to your success have been early days as an entrepreneur? We started, um, we're in year, I think we're in year eight. I feel like we said we were in year seven for four years. Um, I think maybe that's, uh, more of an emotional feeling. Um, yeah. We, so we're eight years in, um, we've always wanted to do something on our own. Um, I, my background is teaching. I was in education for 10 years and my husband has been in commercial construction for um, a little over 10 years prior to us starting this. And so we always felt that the end goal for us was going to be entrepreneurship. And I think that probably resonates with people. I feel like there's accidental entrepreneurs and then like the wishful entrepreneurs and people either my father-in-law was an accidental entrepreneur very successful but it was not his plan yeah, <laughs> it was yeah. not his you know training he was an engineer like that's not an entrepreneur <laughs> brain <laughs> no not, they, you got to talk to people when you're you know when, when you're an engineer and they don't like that so yeah. i understand and then you know on the flip side my dad was a very you know wishful entrepreneur where he kind of always had that drive in him and so we were very much wishful entrepreneurs. Um, and so as we kind of forged into our careers, um, things just kept lining up and my husband kept getting people saying, when are you going on your own? When are you going on your own? When are you going on your own? And so the world really told us that there was a need. Yeah. Um, people were asking not only for work, but you know, they were asking for like our painters were coming to us at the time that Matt knew from previous relationships. So we really just um, took a dive in. And I think from a, from a strategy standpoint, we were extremely frugal and we were extremely bootstrapping um, in our startup. And that's advice that I don't think is often emphasized. Yeah. <laughs> um, we so sold, good. we yep. sold a concept to rower, from our garage to pay for our LLC. We, you know, we didn't do a job unless we could, you know, pay our crews immediately from it. So like we yeah. started with a very slow, um, there's a great book by John Acuff called Quitter. Have you read yeah. that? Oh yeah, that's a great yeah. book. Oh, love that That book. was kind of like our mindset. So Matt was still working full time. I was home with the kids, so I had some capacity to help. Um, at odd hours. And we, we really did spend about 18 to 20 months of it was just on the side, bootstrapping it, which is what Acuff talks about. He talks about putting on your yep. Superman cape at night. <laughs> yeah. So after about a year and a half, then we had a rule, which again is a very intentional strategy. We needed X number of dollars in the bank before Matt was quit, gonna quit his day job. Yeah. And for us, we wanted $100,000 in the bank. That was our both personal income strategy as well as knowing what the business needed to operate. Love that. And so when we had that dollar amount, we said a lot of prayers <laughs> and we woke up with sweaty palms some nights. Oh, and, yeah. you know, at that point, he quit his day job. Fun fact I was 38 and a half weeks pregnant with our third child. <laughs> all and about timing. It's all about timing. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we took it full time. We had our third child. He left the recovery room for a bid. <laughs> and that's how that journey started. <laughs> oh, we have we have so much in common. My my wife and I uh, started our business, you know, together like 
31 years ago, the commitment was you would, she would only do our books for a year and then she would be off the hook. And, uh, I think in year five, she was about to get the epidural for our first son and was having to transfer money from one account to the other so we could cover payroll. (laughs) So we, we have so much to talk about so much in common that, uh, you know, aside from the podcast, but I, I, I relate to that so much. I love that. And it's like, it's, I feel like, um, when you're a wishful entrepreneur, you know, you, you oftentimes look past that gritty stage um, and we gritted for a while and you have to, um, and it sucked. It was uncomfortable. And I had to go see a counselor because I was so overwhelmed because really entrepreneurship is hard. It is. And, um, I, it was not something I'm trained. I'm not trained in the trades. I'm, I'm not a painter. I never have been. And so there was a huge learning curve and I was exhausted and we had three kids at home and, you know, the whole thing is unsexy. Yeah. <laughs> like people see where we are now and they're like, beautiful website, beautiful Instagram. You know, she's so happy and things, but I, like, it's gritty. It's hard. Yeah. yeah. Growth is, is, is something you have to work through. Oh, absolutely. I, I, and I just, I just love how you outline that because at the end of the day, you know, everybody thinks you, you know, open the business and, you know, it, if you build it, they will come and it doesn't work that way. Right. It yeah. very rarely works that way. And there is so much time and energy that's consumed. And especially for a young couple with kids, it, that's, I, I know for a fact, I mean, I'm sure my wife wanted to divorce me on the daily. Right. <laughs> but we made it through because we, we both kind of had goals and ambitions, maybe not as spelled out as you. I'm very impressed. I love, I love the fact that you guys did that and sort of set the high water mark before you would actually dive in. But then even what you were going to have to put towards the effort in order to make it successful. I mean, it's very inspirational. I'd love, I'd love for you just, you know, briefly to touch on from a construction perspective, one of the parts of what we want to do with this series is, is women in construction. And I talk to the women out there that might be, you know, open to a career shift or, a, you know, doing something in this space, whether it's in, you know, the commercial painting business or some other element, what, what's your word of encouragement to a woman to, you know, to forget like the, you know, what they've heard about the industry and still yeah. just go forward and do it? You know, it's, um, it's a grisly little industry for sure. And there's still a good old boys club that exists, but the industry is very much changing a lot. And so even in the seven to eight years, whatever it is that we've been doing this, um, I've seen a shift. And so, um, particularly on the commercial side, so we do a lot of residential as well as commercial, um, but on the commercial side, you know, there's such a push right now. And so, you know, you can go into any GC's office at this point and probably see 30 to 40 percent women yeah. um, and they've not all admin. And I think that's one of the Huge. big things that's changed recently. About five years ago, we went to a ABC banquet, the Associated Builders and Contractors Organization. And we sat down at a table with some steel guys and, you know, they're chatting, talking about hunting and all this stuff. And then this guy looks over at me. He's like, so do you do the books? Oh my God. Like, no, I'm actually the owner. And my husband's <laughs> sitting next to me, just like laughing, like girlfriend runs the show. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I love that. Such is the perception, but it's changing. I mean, there's, um, there's such a presence now. And I think, I think, any woman would be surprised entering the industry now, even versus three or four years ago, um, that it's not as, it's not as Boise as it used to be. Yeah. And, um, that's the, I think that's the encouragement is I think that perception, you know, needs to shift that, um, it's not just a dude's club anymore. Um, yeah. and on the residential side, um, which is still a huge, you know, piece of construction, Sure. people are, I believe there's like a sigh of relief when a woman is involved and like even on the commercial side, but more so on the res side, like we have a project manager. She's a young 20 something year old female. And when she's on job sites, these like rough and tough superintendents and GCs will just like vent to her. Like it's like, she's like, you know, girl talk, you know, they just want to come over and like, have the comforting, like, I mean, everyone has a mom, so, you know, yeah. 
they're fine. There's a certain comfort in women that we've discovered and homeowners feel that way. Like um, it's, and especially with paint, cause you're dealing with design yeah. and color. And so it's easy for us to just kind of like mix into that feeling of, Oh, there's a girl here. Yeah. She gets it. And they feel that way about painters. When our female painters come on, they're like, Oh, she's going to pay attention to detail. She's going to be clean. You know, Yeah. But there's all these positives as well that, um, the stereotypes lend in our favor. <laughs> I, I agree. And I think it's actually a secret weapon. It's a superpower yes. because especially in, you know, any type of commercial or home improvement, right? A lot of times women just get it better than men do. And there's a level of, and you know, I know I'm no, I'm generalizing here, but I, I don't think anybody will uh, yell at me too much about this. There is a level of quality and detail that women just have that guys on, un, unfortunately do not, um, yeah. you know, I know for sure I do not. And yeah. Uh, when I, when my wife puts her mind to something, I know it's going to be like, whatever her vision is, it's going to be 10 times better than I could have ever done it myself. And so there's this value, I think, to having women in this space. I have a, a good friend that owns a plumbing company in Austin, and he has gone out of his way to hire female plumbers. One, because it's you know, just to promote uh, that as a career path, but there is there is a level of calmness and attention to detail that he said that he just cannot duplicate. Uh, but women plumbers get it and they, they can make a ton of money and it's a great career path for them. But um, a lot of women do not consider it as a, as an opportunity. And when he shows them their approach and what they do and that it's not this real dirty kind of business, but it's, you're really doing something that everybody needs and there's a value to it, much like what you guys are doing. There's so much, you know, um, value for that return on investment for them. Yeah. Yeah. It's that attention to detail and, and yeah, women notice things. What is that whole thing? Like the women's brains are spaghetti and the men are boxes or something. Yeah. Um, you know, same kind of thing. And so they are thinking about all the things and they're often, there's like an emotional intelligence, right? So the, the women, not only are they, do we tend to pay attention to detail? I say they, like I'm not one. Not <laughs> only do we pay attention to detail, but we also are thinking about like the ramifications, right? Sure. So if I don't do this, the homeowner might feel this, or if I do this, the homeowner might feel this and, or the client or the GC, you know, whatever it is. And so there's also that next level of understanding how your actions can make people feel, um, that I think we're extra sensitive to. It's yeah. Just how I'm uh, I love that. So what advice would you give a woman that is moving that direction and they come up against like that individual that you met at the, the dinner that night, or you walk into the job site trailer and things are a little tense. How do you, how do you suggest that that individual, whether they're working for an organization in, you know, in any capacity in construction or they're doing their own thing, how do they, how do they step into their power to show that they're there to be collaborative? They're there to, you know, to, to do the job. And, and how do you win, win that over in your opinion? Um, I think it's going to depend on the person. I think for me, um, it's, I'm just going to like stand tall and put my shoulders up and put on my big girl panties and yeah. you know, own it. Even if I feel scared or uncomfortable <laughs> or unsure of myself, which I do. I mean, and part of that's not gender. It's just not having, you know, decades of experience. Sure. In Direction. Um, but, you know, I also think if that's not you, um, I think arming yourself with tools. Uh, we do a lot of back end training with our team um, on, you know, things like that. Like, like um, we just finished reading as a company, the Never Split the Difference. Have you read that? Yeah. One? Oh, yeah. It's a oh, Chris yeah. Wallace. So, yeah. Right. So the whole book is just kind of arming yourself with tools if you are in a conflict negotiation. Um, and so giving our team tools, cause we do have almost half our team is women. And so, yeah, it's, it's tools to say, if you are in this situation, um, and don't know what to do, here are tools. So either, you know, filling your tool belt with stuff, or <laughs> you can just be like me and cowboy it and just show up and 
Make it till you make it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and, it, and it's probably not even so much that, I mean, you have confidence in what you yeah. do and how you do it. Some people are going to be open to it and some people are not. I think, you know, the advice that I'm hearing you really give is the fact that, you know, you be you, right. You do yeah. what you need to do. You're there for a reason. And, um, when, when you show up and, and show up and don't tell them, show up and show them. Right. And yeah. I think, oh, I think yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you definitely come across as, as that kind of person, which I think is great. Makes me think of a, um, someone that I know that has, is now in a leadership position with the school district. She and I met when she brought us in for owner insight into her other school district. And she was kind of the assistant director and she really wasn't thinking about a big leadership role, but a school district came calling and everybody encouraged her. And she said, you know, it was, it was different to slide into that role because, now technically everybody sort of had to work for her and it was amazing how um she she said i could do one of two things try to go with the flow and do it the way that it's always been done or i could set my own sale and um let everybody know that there there was definitely a new sheriff in town we have a do, new way of doing things not it not not for the sake of just upsetting the apple cart but really setting a new standard and her entire goal when she connects with people, you, you know, I should connect you with her. She's amazing. Yeah. Um, but she, she's all about, I don't care whether you're a man or woman or a frog. I want to make you the best that you are and can be. And people yeah. just rise up to be in that space. And that's what's allowed her to just embrace this new uh, leadership role in such a successful way. Yeah, I think that's been a huge problem, or at least the huge thing I've noticed because construction has been male dominated for so long, um, a woman who does come in in a form of leadership, whether she's leading a job site or leading a company, um, you you do you feel like you have to conform to how other people are doing it, and that's you know I had the benefit of being able to kind of bounce things off of my husband, which helps. Oh. Um, but the number of times I question things, I'm like, well, why are we why are we doing it that way? Yeah, and his only answer was. Well, because that's how you do it in construction. And I'm like, yeah, but we could do it so much better. And so similar to this awesome person that you're going to connect me with, like, I think, you know, figuring out what you're good at and what you can offer the situation, whether it's, you know, the strategy of your company or the, you know, job site trailer that has some type of conflict going on, um, you know, you have something to offer, even if it's a little bit outside of the box. Absolutely. You know, and knowing that, like understanding what your strengths are and leaning into those, because then it's also going to be easier to say, I don't know. Like if yep. you've established a strength, so I know my strength is people. And so yep. I can go on a job site and I know how to make people work together, talk together, strategize. I don't always know the terms about construction. Like just the sure. other day, he referenced something. I was like, can you... Can you tell me what that is? <laughs> like, I'm not familiar with that roofing term or whatever yeah. it is. And most people would be scared to say that, but I'd already put in my brain enough. Like I have a gift and a talent here yeah. and it is to, to strategize our sequencing. It doesn't matter whether or not I know what this roofing thing is. I'm just going to say, yeah. I don't know and ask what it is, you know? Yeah. Well, and I think people respect people that do that, right? Instead of BSing their way through it, and then then you run into a problem because there's misaligned expectations or, hey, we talked about this and you're like, well, I didn't really know what that term was. Yeah. And now all of a sudden we're screwed, right? So I think that there's some real value there, but that also takes a, a certain amount of uh, personal power in order to lean into that. And I always tell people, you know, I, I run these companies in, uh, you know, I might be the CEO, but I really go by CDG, which is the chief dumb guy, right? You know, I surround <laughs> myself with brilliant people, thank God, um, that they, you know, still, you know, stick with me, but they are the, they, they're the experts. And I do kind of like what you're saying is I, I'm really good with the people. I'm really good at building client relationships. I'm really good at bringing people to the table when it relates to construction. It's, you have a lot of silos and you have a lot of people that have never been taught how to get along with the other kids in the sandbox. Right. And so yeah. everybody looks at each other as a role and their piece of the role is all that matters. Right. But it, their, their piece of the role touches everybody else's piece of their roles. And that outcome is affected in a big, huge way. If we're all getting along or we understand, or 
we can come to the table and say, we don't know, um, help me understand what's going on. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's so true. Surrounding yourself with people is huge. Um, you can't do this entrepreneurship stuff in a vacuum. Absolutely not. No. <laughs> I mean, and I would he- like to, I'm introverted and shy. It would be great, but I can't do it. It just doesn't work. <laughs> this doesn't work. Even if, <laughs> even if, yeah, even if you can't hire employees, like that doesn't just yeah. mean you have to have a team. Um, it could just mean surrounding yourself with, you know, industry people or, um, well, I'm glad you brought that up because I actually want to ask you about that because one of the things that I really ha- respect and admire about you is how you have pulled people together in this network of resources, right? And it's not just in the painting space. I see how you're you're touching, you know, like you know, through ABC, you know, Association of Builders Contractors, I think, right? Um, yeah. That that organization, you're doing content development for another association that you're involved in. You're bringing people in the industry together uh, in a way that allows them to network and build relationships, which near and dear to my heart with the Ripple, because yeah. if I know you and, and you know, we've gotten to know each other outside. Well, now if we're on the same project together, we're going to have more, you know, more likelihood to collaborate and, and at least engage each other in a much more respectful way. Yeah. It's, Where's that come from? Tell us a little bit about that in some of the things that you're involved in. Well, shoot, man, when you told me about your book, actually, remember I told you I had a copy. I just, <laughs> I'm really bad at reading business books. <laughs> so then I ordered another, so I'd have my own copy and I, I just, I smiled so big because I was like, we so align on kind of what we're doing and, and where we are. But um, this was very uh, accidental. So, you know, certain things that you do in entrepreneurship, but so our first three or four years of business, we grew so fast and so significantly. um, And we didn't pay a dime in marketing for three or four years, like besides building a website. Um, And everyone kept asking. And I was like, most of our jobs are from our friends and like our network. And we go to CrossFit and there's all these like spider webs of things that come from these organizations. And we actually got on a call with some Belmont grad students that were interviewing small businesses. And they were supposed to like interview us and give this analysis as part of their project. And they wrote their analysis and they're like, you guys should lean into network marketing. Oh. Um, it works for you. And it was like, Oh, duh. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) We just like dug in our, um, our employees are all required to be a part of some form of networking group. Um, it can be creative. So one of our estimators who's really involved in designer work, he's not involved in an organization, but he has a, um, scheduled lunch and learn every month at a designer office. And he just kind of like goes around, you know, to different uh, places to teach them that's about awesome. products and, you know, get in front of them. And, you know, then we have other people involved in a- ABC or AGC associated general contract. Oh, yeah. Um, or we're slowly getting involved in NAWIC, the national association for women in construction. Um, and so just finding these ways to get in the community while it was originally, <laughs> intended for business development um, has just become life-giving. You know, Reese, one of our project managers from his work with ABC is now involved in Delta Waterfall, which has nothing to do with construction, but he's made some lifelong friends with this, you know, like traveling journey of networking and all. And I'm so excited for him. Like, cool. So it, it just keeps giving and not just in revenue, you know, I love that in the livelihood of people. I think what you, I mean, what you just touched on though, and before you even went into that, you said we did, we do business mainly with referrals and friends. And a lot of those people that you meet in those areas uh, or those different events or, or through these different avenues of building the network, all of them know somebody who might need what you have, right? Yeah. And and I, I tell this to people all the time when I go in and do a training with the uh, with the company. Everybody needs to know the person who has that whatever that need might be. And a lot of times it's just by, hey, I I you know I know Maggie. Um, I've never worked with Maggie directly, but I know her company does a really good job. Would you like me to connect you? Because she's really good. And if they can't do it, I'm sure she knows somebody who can. Right. And, those things just become this kind of ball that just gets moving. And once it's moving, you've got momentum. And 
you guys yeah. are, are proof of that. I think that the suggestion of having all of your employees involved in something, some group, um, I think is, is brilliant. Um, I have, you're the first entrepreneur that I have ever heard that has done that. And I, my hat's off to you because I think it's, in fact, I'm think, I wrote a book on this and I should have done that with my own people. And now, now you made me feel bad, but <laughs> I, need to, I need to do this, but I think it's phenomenal, not only because it gets you out of your head day to day of just what the work is, right? But at the end of the day, it helps you develop those skills and that confidence level to talk to people at a different level and, and just right. get out. And it's you're building your confidence for you as an individual, which builds your personal brand, but also at the same time, just by extension, you're building the corporate brand as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's great. Let, let me ask you, what's the inspiration behind the name of the, the company? Harpeth so, Painting. Yeah, Harpeth Painting. If you're in Nashville, you know. <laughs> the okay. Harpeth, the Harpeth River runs um, all over Nashville and Franklin. Um, it is funny enough, in 2010, the Harpeth River flooded Nashville, and the house we lived in at the time was flooded. We lost, oh. we had a single story house with four feet of water. We lost both cars and everything in our house, along with thousands of other people in Nashville. It was just a freak event. Um, what's funny though, is the reason we bought that house was because it was on the Harpeth river and we would always canoe and hike and we just loved it. And so after 2010, we obviously had a little bit of a love hate relationship with the river. You know, like we would, we would, we moved to a different house after we rebuilt, but like we would go down to the river and we would smell it and it would just like remind us of this like crappy situation. Yeah. However, what that flood taught us deep in our core was the importance of community. Um, my husband grew up as a very much like, you know, if you're going to do it, do it yourself. So it's right. Yep. And when you lose everything as young people, not making a ton of money yeah. and you realize that like you need help, whether it's financial, emotional, like literal help of ripping out drywall, whatever it was, we just really kind of had a, an aha moment about yeah. how important community is. And you saw that in Nashville. I mean, the whole town just, you know, rallied around every community that flooded. And so over time, you know, as we healed and kind of got out of that memory um, and, and we started this idea of the business, we toyed around with so much. We actually wanted to call it P ain't like P apostrophe A I N T. We thought it was hilarious. It's not, I mean, it's funny, but like, it's a really, not professional paint name. Yeah. <laughs> but, so we kept toying with the idea and um, we had all these other ideas. And then one day Matt just came home and he was like, Harpeth painting. And I was like, there it is. Oh, that's awesome. It's I love cool it. because this, the river itself has so many different, um, there's a South Harpeth, West Har there's all these different tributaries. Is that what they're called? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and they're everywhere in the town. And so it's kind of become a cool kind of reflection about, you know, what we hope to be, which is not just painting everywhere in the town, but a part of everywhere in the town. And, and now full circle, um, one of our biggest donation partners that we share with is the Harpeth Conservancy, which is a nonprofit to help promote, um, you know, the, the cleanliness and the safety of the rivers in Nashville. And so that's kind of been a fun thing to be able to give back to and um, something we're passionate about. So I love that. I mean, eat, yeah, so many ripples to unpack there. I mean, just so <laughs> many different positive ripples that came out of, you know, what was not a positive experience, but ultimately ended up, you know, sort yeah. of uh, defining where you went with your business. I think that's amazing. Yeah. Yeah. I thanks. love that. Well, so I want to be respectful of your time. I always like to finish these. Most of the time when I do a Ripple uh, podcast, I always ask some Ripple connection questions. For those people that are going to tune into this for the construction, this will be a new thing for them. But I always like to get a little bit more sense of who my guest is, right? Just to give a little bit more of a, you know, kind of a, a personal take on, you know, the, the, you know, the person that we've just been listening to and hearing this brilliant advice and you you, you killed it. I mean, you just absolutely grand slam this. So thank you for that. Um, what's the most surprising thing about being an entrepreneur for you? I'm surprised at how happy I've become. Um, I, I don't, I did not ever see myself not being a teacher. 
Yeah. Uh, and, I, and I was kind of an entrepreneur within teaching in terms of how I approached things, but um, I really thought that I was made to teach and I would be a teacher in a classroom for the rest of my life. And so I never expect, and I went through kind of like almost like a mourning period where I was like, I miss it. I miss it. You know, this is so hard. What are we doing? And now that I've really worked hard, both personally and professionally to kind of, you know, make this our freedom machine. Yeah. Um, it's just what it's allotted us, you know, I get to go spend afternoons with my daughters at the farm. They ride horses. I get to play tennis on Thursday mornings with some of my best friends. Like I get to do all these things that are so life-giving and the team that we've built, like, it's just, it's so fun. And I'm so happy in all the things we do. I, I, I didn't expect that, especially when you grind out pretty hard for a few years. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I, I love that. I love that you can lean into that today, you know, to scratch that teacher itch. I got a suggestion if you're curious uh, yeah. or be open to it is take <clears throat> what you've done and what you've built and then go approach the high schools that have these kids that are sophomore, junior, senior, yeah. a lot of the business. Yeah. You know, I was, I was a DECA kid. So I was the yeah. national champion for DECA when I was in high school. And it was a guest speaker that came into our class that really wow. got me exposed inspired about being a business owner, but especially when kids are maybe not going the traditional route all the time with college yeah. and looking at trade opportunities to ha hear your story and what you guys have built. Um, you and Matt have, have really, uh, you know, made a huge, you know, impact, I think in your community through your work, but I think there's a story there that could inspire some young person to want to explore this as an, as an avenue and opportunity, you know, a boy or a girl, right. You know, uh, male or female, right. I think at the end of the day, I think what you, you have to offer there might scratch the the teacher itch a little bit, but you would yeah. really be creating some positive ripples there. I think for people that are, you know, maybe young people that are not sure what they want to do with their, their, their uh, young adult life. You are the first person to suggest that. Cause I've shared that sentiment over the course of time with, a lot of people and it they usually turn it inward right they're like well you know coach your team or find ways to teach within the role of ceo and all these little things but i i that's awesome i really appreciate that when i have a little breathing room in about a year or so <laughs> well if you need help I, I, i'm just a full call away i'd be i'd be happy to call people and tell them you need to talk to her period <laughs> <laughs> Mike dropped that. that. <laughs> let, let me ask you a few more questions. What right. did the seven-year-old Maggie want to be when she grew up? Oh, what a fun question. A teacher. Sorry. <laughs> I lined up my stuffed animals and I would teach them. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Well, and, and I won't ask you your age now, but what does the that's current okay. age Maggie want to be when she grows up? I will be 40 in January. Um, I want to, I want to do what I'm doing now, maybe with a little less hours yeah. to it. I, I love our company. I, I love I, it. I want to keep doing what we're doing, but maybe with a little less time commitment would be cool. Yeah. <laughs> what is your uh, absolute superpower? Um, I think I already said this people like yeah. I, lo I love people. I can be, I can make friends or um, circle up with anyone. Unless you're just like a total asshole. Sorry, if I'm not allowed to say that. I mean, like if you're, you're yeah, we told you're totally allowed. To. Okay, Absolutely. yeah. I mean, like if you're just like the narcissist of all narcissists, let's not go there. But otherwise, for the most part, I can find the good in anyone and make friends with about anyone. I can see that for sure. <laughs> um, if you had the opportunity to put a billboard up that you know with a message that everybody would see every single day, what would it be? I think it would just say to smile. <laughs> I mean, there's like neurology to it. There's, you know, there's reality to it. If you just smile, it's probably going to change something. <laughs> Maggie, I've asked that question a hundred times and that's the first time anybody has answered really? it. Really? I mean, I love I that. It, like a bright safety yellow with just the word smile. Huh? Here, yep. you know, it's going to be great. It'll make that's, someone smile. That's awesome. When you hear the term, the ripple effect, what does that mean to you? Um... I mean, you envision water, right? And and just <laughs> the way it flows, but also that you don't know where it's going to flow. You can't control the flow. You can maybe control where you drop the pebble, yeah. um, but how far it's going to go and what direction it's going to go is outside factors. And isn't that the truth for um, for any 
you know, application to business or relationships or people or life, you know, you have no idea the impact you're going to have. And oftentimes, if you think you're going for an impact, it might not even be the one, you know? <laughs> yep. Uh, that's a great, another great answer that uh, nobody has ever touched on. I love oh, that. that's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, I'm always about, you know, trying to give back in any way I can. So what ripple could I create for you or your business? Um, wow. That's an answer that I don't have. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, I appreciate being on here. And I think the opportunity, you know, for us to share this and just for people to hear that this is really who we are. It's not just something that we're posting on our website. Um, and I think you did a great job of that with these questions. So oh, thank you. Well, I appreciate it. We'll, we'll definitely get this promoted out on yeah, multiple channels, but um, last, um, last thing I would ask is how would you like people to get in touch or follow you? And if, and if somebody was out there that is considering, you know, getting into the construction space, yeah. uh, if there's a woman that might be looking for a little guidance and advice, is it okay if they reach out to you? And if so, how would you like them to do so? For sure. I think the easiest way, especially on a podcast, is just um, to hop on you know, Instagram or Facebook. Um, Harpeth Painting LLC is our handle. Um, and it's, it's not run by me. I have awesome people. But as soon we get a lot of people who reach out yeah. to contact the owners. And so it'll immediately get to me at some way, somehow, but social media is the easiest. If I tried to say my email, it would be, you know, clunky and silly. So just find Harpeth painting. Harpeth painting, Harpeth painting, LLC.com, right? For the yes, website. Yes. Yeah. You can yeah. contact us on the website. Even if, you know, it's not for a paint job and you're trying to get a hold of us, our emails are all on our website um, and then Instagram as well. So we try to make it easy to get a hold of us. Well, Maggie Kuyper, thank you so much for your time today. We are so grateful that you took the time. I know you were super busy. You got a lot going on, um, but I am so grateful that you agreed to do this. I would love to, at some point in the future, uh, leave the door open for us to to do another one because there's yeah. so so much more that I could ask you. But uh, and I know that people are going to really learn so much from this, uh, from your you know from your great wisdom. And so I'm just so grateful to know you and appreciate the fact that you took the time to to visit with us today. So thank you. Well, thank you for doing this. You're doing the same thing. You're taking the time to impart all kinds of. Um, great experiences and wisdom on, on people. So props to you. Uh, well, thank you for that. I appreciate that. I, I, it's going to give me super, you know, big pride to go back to your dad and say, we finally did this and I'm so <laughs> jazzed. So, um, but uh, yeah, I appreciate everybody tuning in. Obviously, if you're getting this through the Ripple Effect podcast, uh, thank you for listening. As always, we'll be back with another great uh, guest very soon. And for Owner Insight, you know, we're going to continue to focus uh, great individuals in construction, especially women in construction that are out there doing great work like Maggie. So if you happen to know anybody, let us know. Uh, we would love to interview them. So please uh, stay tuned for future episodes as well. Mm -hmm.